Welcome to Silicon Valley Asian Business Talk. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Roger Chen from Center for Business Studies and Innovation in Asia Pacific, University of San Francisco. Uh, Vera, I want to welcome you to our interview program. And would you please briefly introduce yourself? Thank you, Roger. It's a real pleasure uh, to join you on this uh, podcast. Uh, my name is Vera. I'm from uh, Sustainable Living Lab. Uh, we're a group of companies that basically uh, deliver services around sustainability, uh, consulting, and also all the adjacent sort of activities in that space. We've been around as a business for 14 years. Uh, we started out headquartered in Singapore. Uh, today, we have offices in Indonesia, India, and the US, and we operate in about 30 countries. Uh, we have a staff strength of about 80 people. Uh, delivering services uh, in this space. How to incubate sustainability venture business? You have incubated many projects. Oh, seems to me actually you are holding companies almost like an innovation factory. You know, I heard I learned this term from uh, PNG. Your sole job is to create a new venture projects, test it. If it's fail, you close it. Any wisdom? Any advice on identifying new projects? incubating projects, shutting them down, or making them, you know, spin them out? Any kind of a wisdom to share with us? So like I said, the one thing that doesn't change is we try to specialize in the problem space, mm. right? Uh, but so, so, so we're not wedded to any technology. We're not wedded to any solution. I mean, if you look at technology, right, we started out focusing on digital fabrication, right? And then we moved into looking at IoT, Internet of Things. Then we moved into computer vision and robotics. And then now we are dealing with AI. Mm -hmm. Right? So we are not particularly wedded to any technology stack, I would say, right? What we're wedded to is the problem space. So we are quite clear from the get-go that we want all our companies working on the numerous associated issues around sustainability. Right. Mm. And, and and this can be anything from climate mitigation, carbon removal stuff, all the way to training, to sustainability reporting and, and data collection. It could it could even be, you know, as like, you know, doing recycling, e waste management and uh, wastewater treatment. It could even be climate adaptation, you know, uh, uh, protecting against heat stress, wildfires and flooding. So there is a world of potential issues that needs somebody to do something useful to address them, right? Now, the problem is that the timing is not always right. When I mean timing, I mean that the market desire and demand for the solution or for the particular problem to be solved uh, may not be there. The uh, 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 customers, right, or, or the finance uh, may not be, be there, right? You, uh, the, the funding situation or... or the investment situation in that space might be very bleak, for example, right? Or you find that the policy or regulatory environment is not ready yet, right? And I think, I think like, you look at a few years ago, the idea of sustainability reporting was seen as a voluntary activity, right? Yeah. In the last two years, we are seeing so many countries mandate sustainability reporting, right? So you have to do it. You have to spend mm. money, get someone to do it for you, right? But when I started, it was a voluntary thing, right? So the regulatory environment had to change, in order for us to fully realize the promise of that particular, you know, uh, uh, opportunity, right? So a lot of times you actually have to kind of spot where the timing is right and then strike. But we're always looking at these things, right? We're always looking at the sustainability space and we're saying that, oh, something has shifted, something fundamental has shifted in this space right now. Let's quickly go in and get something going over there, right? So, so for example, one of the things that we currently see today is that people are beginning to have sort of, you know, uh, um, I, I would say a loss in faith in the uh, COP or, or climate uh, mitigation uh, process, right? People mm -hmm. are beginning to say, you know what, I think in a world that's becoming more bipolar and no longer multipolar, we are not going to have that great sort of international collaboration to mitigate against carbon emissions. So you're going to see that our 1.5C target is most likely going to fail, right? And so the way we are thinking about it is that, okay, that's a big problem and it's pretty sad it's at that state. But what does that mean? It means that the fact that countries 
and governments and companies have to adapt to the climate instead. So climate adaptation instead becomes much more important. The relative importance of it goes up, right? And climate adaptation has been criminally underfunded for years. Criminally underfunded, right? Climate adaptation gets 5% of the funding that climate mitigation gets. It's a joke, mm, right? So, could you elaborate? Could you elaborate the difference between the two? Because for many people, yeah. may not be hundred yeah. percent. Sure, no problem. Right. So, so if, when we look at climate change, there are basically two ways to address it. So, climate mitigation is basically you want to remove carbon from the atmosphere by various means and forms uh, in order to reverse climate change. So, the idea is reversal. Climate adaptation is basically the understanding that while you are doing all the reversing stuff. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a couple of decades. You're going to need to adapt to the changes that will happen anyway. You're going mm. to adapt to rising sea levels, adapt to higher temperatures, adapt to water stress, adapt to wildfires. You know, California, right? It's, I think, front and center of this, right? So you yeah. have to adapt to it. And adaptation means that you need new technologies, new services, new ways of doing insurance, new kinds of housing, all sorts of things. And you have to basically reimagine the entire system, right? on how are we going to survive the changing climate. So the perfect space to be in is you want to be doing activities that both mitigate, meaning you prevent further damage to the environment and also allow you to adapt. So for example, a good example, you know, or rather a negative example is air conditioning, right? So it's very hard. So we say, you know what, let's use some air conditioning. But air conditioning is considered a maladaptation. Because it makes the problem worse, right? Because you actually end up releasing more carbon emissions. But if, let's say, you move to a air chiller system, right? We are using uh, uh, some kind of uh, more, you know, passive flow system to make the air cooler and so on. Then that's considered a more positive sort of, you know, uh, a space between your boat mitigating the climate change and your boat adapting to the hotter environments, right? Mm. So there's, there's a whole range of solutions in this space. And where we strive to be in is like, we see that there will be naturally much more attention moving towards climate adaptation as people start losing faith with climate mitigation efforts. It's mm -hmm. a very natural thing, right? So we want to put ourselves in front of that uh, uh, development. But we, can but we can only do that because we're constantly having our eyes in this space. Right? And, and that allows us to see that, you know what, something's changing over here. You know, let's put ourselves in front of that. Right? Now, we may be wrong, but then it will be another field experiment for us. Thank you for watching.